you kind of how we do things with the 67s and and maybe you take something from it but we're not saying like this is the right way to do it this is the way you have to do it this is just how we do things with the 67s and we find uh you know it works for us and we believe in the process of how we do things so if you can take one or two things from this great and try it when you're go back coaches so and if it works for you it works for you and if it doesn't maybe you know you learn something new anyway so um i was originally just going to start talking about our pro our and um, our pillars would lead into what Evan talked about last week with our skills and how we correlate our pillars with the skills. But I did a seminar with a few coaches in Toronto and uh, we started talking about the process and I showed him a video about the process and uh, it really hit home with him. So I thought I would share it tonight. It was kind of a last minute addition. And talking about the process. So Whenever you as coaches are, are planning something, it's very important to have a plan and the staff to embrace the plan and trust the process. To make them part of the plan, you cannot measure success on wins and losses, but rather measure success with your team's plan as a group. For example, you may lose five games in a row, um, but if you measure your team by success and wins and losses, there's nowhere to get better. So, for example, if you win a, five, a game 5 nothing, and everything is good, you win five, nothing, but your team played like shit. But if you measure your team played well and you won five, nothing, okay, you played, you played well. But if you lose a game five, nothing, but your team played well and you're working and get better in the areas you want to get, then you have somewhere to focus your attention on. And it's not just on wins and losses. And I find a lot of coaches and myself included, for example, when I first got back playing, I started coaching my first year with the 67s and I was, um, I was a power play coach. And so when I started getting into it, I never really thought about the whole process of breakouts, entries, zone. I always focused more about, okay, we uh, score went two for four tonight. So it was a successful night for us. But meanwhile, maybe we, we got a goal because of uh, Marco Rossi went through three guys and he scored a goal, but it wasn't really a team thing on a power play. So it really got me focused years ago with Andre talking about the process and understanding it and having a plan. So, and in doing that, I never measured our success on the power play based upon our results on it. I always measured upon our breakouts, our entries and our puck recoveries. And so those were the areas really, I really focus on and embrace and made sure that they were part of the process in doing that. And so in going forward there, um, I wrote there, trust the process, stick to the process, embrace the challenge. And at the end of the day, rewards will come. And it's really hard to do sometimes. And sometimes it's discouraging because you're going with the process and things are starting to get better, but you still don't see any rewards. So then you start to maybe start second guessing your process and your plan. But if you do that, you start to lose faith in your players, maybe your coaching staff, and maybe you have to talk about it, but you have to really stick to your, your process and your plan and believe in it. And if you do that, and if you really stick to it, it'll come at the end of the day and rewards. And it, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, I find my, ask myself this a lot as a coach, what am I in it for? What's, why am I doing this? And I always come back to the same answer. It's not to have the best power play in the league. It's not to be the best team in the league. Yeah, we all want to win, but wins aren't going to come just by going on the ice and doing it. You have to have a process. And for me, what I do this is to see my players get better every single day. Why, for example, if uh, Timmy goes in the corner and he's always getting beat out of the corner and you teach him some lessons for like the skills that we're going to talk about puck protection and he's getting better now and he finally beats the guy out of the corner and he goes in net and creates a good chance. That's successful. That's, that's good. That's a challenge. That's really good. So for us, measuring those success that way and for the coach, that's really rewarding at the end of the day when you see a player get better after the skills you're talking to him and you're teaching him about the game and the understanding the game him get better that's your reward as a coach seeing them get better and at the end of the day if you win or lose okay fall where they are but you can be proud of yourself if you stick to it and you teach your players the right way you can lot to be proud of it and so i'm going to show a video here and how i got onto this topic was i saw this video and it really struck me um this is a coach with iowa he came from nowhere um he was kind of brought into the team. It was a team that was not doing what you can see their 25th, ranked 25th, and they weren't supposed to accomplish anything. 
but together in four years, they went all the way up the ranks and then they end up winning. So I'll share the video here. A couple things for you guys, listen to me, and then I'll let you go. Okay, the biggest thing that I've got to tell you is this. You're teaching the world that in this sport, college football, toughness, discipline, and detail still matter. That's your platform. Your platform is, it is, it is team above self. That's the platform that you're using. And nobody wants to buy into that in our culture today. Okay, our culture says, it's all about me. Our culture says, screw process. I want instant gratification. But here's a fact, and young guys, listen to me. If you fall in love with the process, if you fall in love with the process, then eventually, Ogie, eventually the process will love you back. But see, here's what's crazy about that. You don't know when it's gonna love you back, okay? All you have to do is you gotta be prepared for your opportunity when it's ready to love you back. Now think about that, because that's powerful. There's some young guys in here that are still trying to climb the ladder. Okay, what you guys that have grinded it out, have stuck it out, have believed it out, you fell in love with the process. And the process is now loving you back. And if you want to continue on this journey, I'm telling you it's a dark, lonely road. You see all this around you and everybody wants to buy in. They want to buy the stock now, right? They want to jump in. They want to be a part of it. Okay? But you got to shove it away. It's a dark, lonely road if I told you, if you want to stand on that platform at the end of this and the confetti comes down and you stayed the course. It's really hard to do. Easy to say it. It's a pretty powerful video. Uh, it says a lot. And so when I saw this video, I thought maybe to share it tonight with you guys and kind of maybe get a little bit off topic, but it kind of leads into where I'm going with and embracing the process. So, just gonna click out of here for a second, boys. Bear with me. Here we go. So it leads into what uh, you guys were on there last week for the guys who were on last week with Evan talking about our skills, and it's. What we call is uh, in our skills, we define it. So us as a team, we break it down into pillars. And for example, skills used in puck protection, skills used in creating space, skills used around the net. Uh, these will be skills that will impact your style of play that your team desires to play. Uh, pillars are a great way to focus on the development of the players and at the same time will improve your style of play. There is no right or perfect pillars. It has to come from what you believe in will help your team play the way you want them to play. So for example, we have our four pillars with the 67s. And so the process leads into this because all the work we do in focusing on the pillars and the process, if they don't believe in it, if they don't believe in all the work we're putting into all these pillars and all the skills, then if they don't believe in it, it's gonna fail. And so they bought into it, our players bought into it. And now we start to create a culture and we start to create um, an identity for our team. And, and, and us coaches, we can, press and press and press but you know you need to press the right way but your players have to believe in it and they have to feel part of it and if they feel part of it they will embrace it and they'll take it on their own and then they can hold each other accountable as well and so what are pillars so this through the seminar I'll try to explain some of these things here uh, what are pillars why are pillars so important when are pillars used during game situations how much time should you spend on building pillars and how to enforce and grow your pillars um, connecting pillars with skills. When you, by implementing pillars, a style of play, you can narrow down the specific skills required to play the certain style you desire. And we're not talking about shooting techniques or the ability to have a quick release. We're talking about the ability to swing your ass and protect the puck, a jab step to escape pressure, edge work to create space. These are some of the skills that are required for our group, the style that we at the 67s want to play. For us, our pillars are creating space, attitude at the net, a 2 on one game, and closing quickly. If you think about and the game in general, if you spend a lot of time, and I'm not saying it's the right or wrong way, but if you think about it, if you think about the defensive zone play, 
uh, system and structure, offensive zone structure, four check. If you break it down and try to be perfect on all those situations, you're going to spend a lot of time and energy on systems. When if you pick four or five of your pillars, the way you want to play, for example, um, closing quick on a four check. If your first player is going closing quick, there's nothing about structure here. If your first player is closing quick, he's going on the guy with a good angle. Okay, now you have something going. It's either man on, your second guy's ready to react, your third guy's high. There's no real pressure or structure there, but you have pillars to talk to your players about. For example, a breakout, a two-on-one game, um, going through the neutral zone, how to attack that space. How do you create your two-on-one? Where do you go to create your two-on-one? How do you create that space as a puck carrier, a non-puck carrier? All over the ice, defensive zone, neutral zone, all these pillars are in play and there's zero to talk about structure. It's all about playing the game the right way with the structure we have in place. So there's a lot more communication with the players. So if Tommy comes back to the bench, you're not talking about a neutral zone coverage. You're talking to maybe, hey, could you have closed quick there? Did you have a good angle there? Or did you protect the puck? So there's a lot of more situations where you can talk to your players and have a conversation with them and build relationships versus always talking about structure, structure, structure. So the first part here for us creating space is counter hits, cutting hands, puck protection, ass out, 50-50 battles, and challenging their D. So I'm going to switch over here. i got some video we're going to show. So as the video is going, I'm just going to talk about it. I'm let the video roll as I'm going to be talking about it. Um, but you'll see in all these situations, again, I talk about it. There's, there's no structure here. It's all about how we want our players to play and develop, developing their skills to be a better player. And in doing that, our overall game, we feel, will be better. So here we go, number 10 here gets in really good. Instead of going out the puck, he gets in, gets nice and low. 67's pressing, 29. Constantino foul, but kept him to the wall. Same here, 21 gets in. Nice and no tight. Arm. Now, yep. Um, can you just lower the volume on your uh, on your videos? We Absolutely. can't hear your, We can't hear you talking over the video. Okay. Is that better? Oh. The video uh, now they'll go in that was pinch no it's still uh it's still loud okay i'll turn the volume off so again here he gets inside creates his own puck position battles tight turn we got a guy in front of the net we... nico gross in the corner behind the net for stud nico here instead of going right at the puck now he cuts the body position of the defense the, the couldn't take it off his skate for him on the opposition and so uh, you here again 26 boom squeezes him off gives himself a chance to get first on puck. you get some uh, unexpected offense kind of from mr guardy a quick play sorry norm the video is the video position is... separates the puck from his opponent gets in now in this case other player second quick here's another opportunity for here's a really good example here instead of making it a 50 50 he gets in let me rewind it a little bit and stop here's another opportunity for so right here if you look at this picture their guy's ahead of our guy so if number two for us hoffenmeyer was to just go for a 50 50 straight at the puck he would probably lose that puck so instead of creating a 50 50 in the corner he creates his 50-50 right now, and he gets in tight and creates body position and then creates the player from the puck and giving him the chance to get first on puck versus creating a Long pass up the middle. Corner. That's Oxentia. And here, separates the puck. It's good body position. And our right up. Takes him out of the play in the puck. For him. Here again, really good clip. If Marco Rossi goes straight for the puck, it becomes a 50-50 up all the ice, and then it's a 50-50 battle for the puck. But here, Marco does a great job at cutting the hands of the opponent. He's a good five, six feet before the puck, but he cuts in front, and that gives himself a chance to buy 
The space he needs, separate. And he had four points, two goals, now two assists in the preseason. Here's Clark second far The next few clips are on D, really using their ass, separating themselves. You're the first man there for the Something the elder gray was. You've got a big guy, small guy, but if he plays that way, it doesn't matter the size you are. He's really happy about General Resnick will come up with it. Winterton Pope 15. Graham Clark in the all over the ice, all over the ice. As an opponent, man, you're like, man, they are totally boxing. They might think you're physical, you're tough, but really, there's no hard hits here. It's just getting good body positioning. You really good job here at cutting to the net. Norm, sorry, can you just uh, can you... here's one of my favorite clips. Norm, can you cut the video uh, Clark, uh, sound? If, so Cody Clark does a nice tight turn button hook back, but if Cody Clark stays against the boards. Number seven blue can easily have a better chance of cutting him off. But Cody here, you'll see, cuts to the net. And then he buys that step on number seven. You'll see here. Now seven get cuts off by the net. Just by Cody coming to the net, using that as a, as a, I guess, like a pylon. He has to get around it. Again, he does it again here. Uses the net, buys himself some space. And now number seven has to go on the opposite side of the net because he cuts him off. He goes up the boards. Tommy Johnston now. Johnston, around King. Hard, playing with our skills. Again, he cuts to the net. And this is number 16 in our team. Tommy Johnston still with it. Johnston spinning guy. away from King. Number 10 on them's King. Big guy. But if you look at this clip, he's fast. King. In behind the goal. Back to the point. That hard shot off the point. These are all skills here that we work on every single day in practice, our pillars. And in games, we, we press on it a lot. Kicked ahead really there by Jack, by Jack Quinn. Quinn Working against Logan Morris and Quinn. And this Great puck pursuit by Jack Quinn as he tries to find somebody out in front. Here's Guy really Murphy. Because we want to lead. The next few clips here are our D. And we work a lot with this, especially with Mario in practice, our D coach. To work constantly on D skills, puck retrievals, knowing your options. If it's three feet, five feet, ten feet, the distance you have between your opponent. And he works a lot on jab steps, uh, Crosby's opening up the hips. Here's a really good job by Nikita here. Does a really good jab step. Buys some time and space. Swing. And he's gone. Here again, little swing of the stick. Boop, jab step. As the puck gone. lost in his skates. Really good job by here, Matty. The Ottawa Open zone. Stick. Jack Mateer. Separating himself. Teddy here using the net again. Three steps, bang, 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 bang. Moves his feet. Gets the ice, moves the puck. Up the boards. Here, um, so when I talk about team play and skills, we always talk about bumps. And in today's game, a lot of times it's uh, interference or whatever. But if you're skating and do, doing it properly and you're skating in the same direction, which we work on a lot, the ref is never going to call it. And by doing this, you're giving your, your teammate more time to make a play. And again, think of his as if you're the guy going to, on a four check and you always have to go around a body, how much more energy you have to spend when you're thinking about it to go in there on a four check, knowing that you're gonna get a little bump, you're gonna get held up, you're gonna have to work twice as hard to get around that guy to get in on the four check. So we spend a lot of time and effort working and talking about this in videos. So here are the next few clips are just on us, getting some bumps, bumps over the stick time, a little of bit of space, getting open here and then a reverse hit. We don't spend like this, but this guy here, Mayor Griffin, local guy. Back in the puck in the at it. Here, really good job by Hoff. Just getting a little bit of body position, not too much. Zone. Just enough. Back is Belanger. Not going away. We know that. Number one. Here again. And more times, if it's early, the refs aren't going to come. In the Ontario Hockey League, Gross is back on the ice. So seems to be already in that position to block a guy. So when you talk about team tough, when we talk about team tough, it's not going out there and hitting guys and being physical and and being dirty and cross-checking. And no, no, team tough for us is doing all those little things, little squeezes, little bumps, uh, counter hits, um, squeezing on the boards. When you play like that as a team, as an opponent, when you come in, you're like, oh my gosh, they're all over. They feel like you're all over the ice, and it's hard. And you have to spend so much energy to get from point A to point B because you have a guy in between you all the time. That is, to me, for us, is playing team tough. 
The next few clips are just small details uh, on entries. When you see here, you watch number two when he drives to the net, he'll take this stick to the opponent just enough to disturb him a little bit. So the puck carrier now can make a play, make an option. It's a small detail, but it's a big detail. It can make a big detail and a big thing in a, in a game. Here, whoop, takes the stick, just bugs him a little bit. Possibly can open up a lane. You'll see on the next clip, but bugs him a little bit. Good chance. 67. Here comes Clark for the second thing here. Here, boom, takes the stick away, has a purpose, drives, creates that little. Good. Ottawa. There's a pat the net. Good chance at the net. The next part here for one of our pillars is um, attitude at the net. Uh, rebound ready, hunt loose pucks, screen with a good balance and positioning, rebound skills, and push offs. Any questions so far, guys, about the first pillar? Norm, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Now the other way, Quinn. So when we talk about attitude at the net, it's not just... As back. You'll watch number 17 here. He shoots it at the net, but his two or, two or three strides afterwards are bang, 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 bang. He's on puck. He's not watching and waiting to see what happens. As soon as it's on net, his attitude is, I'm getting that puck, bang, bang, bang. He's on puck, and now we're first on it, and now we get the chance to play with the puck because he is... Drop for Ulster, the shot for some legs. Now we get it. And then again, you'll see two guys going at the net. They're not near the net. They're at the net. The answers. Can't clear the zone. Hold your quick Watch, 17. Puck gets chipped in the corner. Shot right on by Quinn. Bang, bang, bang. He's on puck. Two on it. We got possession of the puck, and now we stay in the offensive zone. If our guys look and see what happens after the play, maybe we don't get first on puck. They get that puck, and then they break out. And one thing we always talk about in our practices is after every drill or during every drill, a shooting drill, a warm-up drill, whatever the drill is, after your shot on net, if your puck gets, say, off the pad and goes into the corner, you finish your play. You go to the puck. And you stop. Obviously, you don't want to get the puck go for rebound. It's a shooting drill, a warm-up drill. But no matter where the puck goes, you're going bang, bang, three steps, and you're finishing the play as if it was a game situation. Even if you shoot the puck and it's on the goalie, bam, bam, bam you're going to the goalie, and the play is freeze from there. So every time we're on it. So all these skills and all these pillars we're talking about, we're always implementing them in every single practice and every single drill. Um, and so we stay on it, we stay on it, we stay on it, we stay on it. If a player um, doesn't do it in a, sit in, a, in a practice, we'll blow it down. And you just got to remind them once. You say, hey, what did you, you forget to do here? Uh, yeah, you're right. I forgot to track the puck to the net. Okay, bam, blow the whistle. They're back at it. And just sometimes a quick little reminder. But if you stay on them with all these small details, small details, and embracing the process and trusting all these small details in practice, they're going to pay off in our games because it'll become natural to them. They'll know exactly if I get a shot on net, boom, tracking the puck right away. Was there to here we get that puck, we keep it in. Again here, good job at front of the net. We're not around the net, we're at front of the net. Great body position here, gets, cuts the hands, buys a little bit of time, separation, and all by a small play at the net, leads to a pretty nice goal. And some. We love that stuff. Again, right here, we have two guys, one guy at the net in front. Play by rip. At the net, right in front of the goalie's eyes. And oftentimes, you'll see players around the net trying to butterfly it in and trying to do this. But same thing in our practices. If we're screening a guy, a goalie, we're screening the goalie. We're not near the net. We're at the net taking the goalie's eyes away. And you'll see our second guy here who ends up scoring the goal. He spins off, and this one that ends up scoring the goal here. Rip and shoots. Loose puck scramble. They... Simple play. It's a shot at the net. 
But if our guy in front of the net, say, peels off to the corner. Obviously went back to the suit when his career was over. Loose puck, they score. Again here, bam. Puck gets up to our nipple guy, our slot guy. Two guys. Comes up with it. Back to the bang, bang, bang. right in front. They score. Can Puck's up top. We got a guy in front of the net. Guy on his way to the net. Battling in front. We're down 2-1 to one in the third period. The 67's and coming at the 14-36 mark on the... And here, guy at the net. The guy going to the net. We have a good F3 high. The power play. I'll Reads the play. Great, great read going in. Good shot at the net. Got you. Pause his weight. Rebound. They score. Turn it around. Small detail. Two guys at the net. Shot at the net. They're fronting. If, if you're fronting and you... Takes the shot. Yeah, blocked in front. Yeah. Tolnai takes it. Crossbar. Same situation here. We have a guy battling in front of the net. We have an F3 ready to go. Wilson, again, through a crowd. Medina oh, down. Scrambling so underneath. I know, I know. Oh, no. Bit, you're going to rattle them a little bit. So in playoffs, who knows? You get against a hot goalie, you're battling, you're rattling. You might get on his. So the next clips are uh, obviously NHL clips, but they're both the attitude around the net defensively and offensively. And just when I, when I first saw these and I was like, man, this is incredible. I get goosebumps, but I'm just going to let these ones roll. I'm not going to say I'm going to put the volume up so you guys can hear the energy that comes, man. It's, it's amazing. But again, it all correlates to the willingness to do it, the constant reminders of the players to do it and becoming their habits and becoming pillars. So the players own it, the players know it, and it then becomes natural. Bang, 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 bang. cool stuff when you watch that and then uh relate it back but uh but so it's pretty cool um so again everything relates back to all of our pillars and creating space and attitude at the net and when we're constantly doing that with the players it becomes things where like i talked about before where you can correlate and talk to your players on any situation during the game and not just focus so much on the structure of the game and your systems but every single action of the game there's a purpose to it and by us creating these pillars we give an area for us to focus on and for our players to focus on and for example um 
a guy going out to the point man, having a good angle, good stick, closing quick. Those are all small things that we work on. And in practice, we incorporate it. Um, so I have a couple of drills here that it was hard for me to put it on my XOs, but I, I put it on here if you just want to take a shot of it. These are just simple warm-up drills that we incorporate into our practices sometimes. And every drill, like, I mean, these ones are more specific for the specific skills we want to work on. But like I said before, in all of our drills, two-on-ones, three-on-twos, three-on-three, uh, five-on-five low drills, they're, all of our pillars are being incorporated into every single drill. But these are some small drills where you can kind of warm up drills where you can work on some, some of those smaller, smaller drills. So um, again, the first one there is just one guy in front is going to keep coming back and forth, cutting the hands of the guy going behind them. And then they'll pass the puck to the coach and then they'll switch roles going back. Um, player from one corner will come across the second one. The player from one corner will come across, cut the hands of the other player, take that puck. They'll go around the cones doing Crosby's, come back center lane and shoot. After you get your hands crossed and go to the other side and repeat it, so on and so on and so on. But yeah, if you want to take a picture of it, probably easier. And it's hard for me to explain it as we're going here without moving, but there's a few drills if you want to take a picture of it or whatever. All right, moving forward. Um, you know, when there's nothing left to do. The last part here is kind of another um, add-on. I was talking to a bunch of coaches, and we we're getting just some feedbacks and areas we can talk about, and areas which we think can talk about. And the one area that keeps coming up and that we talk about often is values. And we feel it's, it's, it's so important to have team values and, um, and how all of this is possible before skills, pillars, systems, X's and O's, you need to build the foundation of uh, values. Values come from within. It's what makes you burn inside when a certain value is not upheld. For example, a member on your team doesn't push through, gives up, says it's too hard and quits. The value for this can be not being resilient. Therefore, the team value could be resilience. Um, the values will have nothing to do with the skill or how well a player can read the play. It will be all about the person and the choices they make. It will, by having values based upon the person and choices, it puts everyone on the same playing field. There's no favorites. There's no um, superstar on your team. You all follow the same values. You all have the same code of conduct. And whether you score three goals, but you are a jackass of a teammate, that's not going to fly with us. I don't care if you score three goals, you score the overtime winning goal. That's not a part of our values. And so that's not going to work with us. And once you instill that with your team and your team believes and trusts in those values, and sometimes often you can have them, um, what I find with uh, younger players is having them part of the process of picking the values. Uh, maybe you have inside your own values that you like, you have your four or five. Um, so you maybe you, you keep the two or three and then you give it to the players. Say, hey, guys, what's something, what's a value, a team value we can have? Something we can all rally behind and get behind. And then they'll come up with a bunch of answers. And then if you like them, okay, yeah. But if not, you maybe steer them in. What do you think about uh, respect? What do you think about this? You might be able to steer them into the direction you want to go. And during, the, during COVID here, we challenge our players. Uh, we do seminars with them every Wednesday. And we challenge our players with, we broke them into groups of four or five, and we, we had each of one of them groups come up with one of our values. And so this is one of the values that four or five of the players came up with and did. And I think it's, uh, it, it, it's amazing what they did, and I want to, to show it to you guys. A.D. Williams once said, imagine what seven billion humans could accomplish if we loved and respected one another. Just imagine. Imagine if there was no greed. Imagine if there was no comparison. If everyone was running their own race, but cheering for all others at the same time. Maybe we'll never see that in our lifetime. But what we all can do is start with ourselves. Start with yourself. Choose to lift others up. Choose to set the example. The example of kindness and integrity. 
the example of compassion and understanding. There's a quote that says, no matter how educated, talented, rich, or cool you believe you are, how you treat people ultimately tells all. Integrity is everything. It really is. Who you are is far more important than what you have. And it will always be. Who you are is measured by how you make others feel. Be kind to each other. In a world where you can be anything, be kind. Choose to be the change you wish to see in the world. Decide you will not wait for someone else. You will set the example. Be kind. Because you never know how much that person is suffering inside. You never know the difference your words can make, the difference your presence can make, the difference you can make to one human life. Be the reason someone believes in the goodness of humanity. Be the reason someone else decides to make a difference in others. Be the influence you want to see more of. Always do what is right. Not what is easy in the moment. Kindness spreads like a virus. When you do good to another, that person does better to those they come in contact with. You really can make a big difference in the world today and every other day. And Frank said, in the long run, the sharpest weapon of all is a kind and gentle spirit. No one has ever made themselves great by showing how small another is. Be kind and always build others up to the best of your ability. Treat everyone with the same level of kindness that you would like for yourself. Not because everyone is nice, but because you are. Because karma makes no mistakes. Because it is right. Because you have integrity. Because you want this world to be better when you leave than when you arrive. Respect, by definition, is a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. But for us, the meaning is something much bigger. It is very important to show respect to your teammates on and off the ice. These are the guys that you call your brothers and go to battle with. Different ways you show your teammates respect is by listening before you speak and allowing different opinions, thoughts, or anything directed at you. Showing respect to your teammates is helping them back up when they do wrong and showing them how to fix their error, not telling them what they did wrong. To show respect is working your hardest on the ice so everyone around you can get better too, not cutting corners in the gym or doing half the reps. Respect is pushing your teammates when he has two reps left and when he is finishing the sled test. Respect is a key part when it comes to winning as a team and will help the team all be one. At the 67, it is important to show our coaches and trainers respect. Coaches and trainers are a huge part of our development as players and people. We can simply show, show coaches and trainers respect by respecting their decisions, respecting their thoughts, respecting their opinion, and simply showing them that we respect the efforts that they give for us. The most important way I think we can respect our coaches and trainers is by giving 110% effort on and off the ice day in, day out. Having respect for medical staff means being 15 minutes early for an appointment, having showered, put clean gets on, as well as keeping the medical room clean and picking up after your teammates if they left garbage behind. Our medical staff is there to help us, not to clean up after us. I don't want to win a championship because we got a bunch of low lights in here. And they start laughing like some of y'all. Like low life ain't really you call it low life, you know, and I'm like, yeah, low life. Because we got volunteer firemen walking around here cleaning up after grown men. Right? My locker, your locker, is two feet from the garbage can. You come off, take cut your tape off your ankles, your wrist, and instead of you throwing it in the garbage can, where you throw it at? On the floor. I'm like, listen guys, this is the little things, man. Pick up your towel. You walking out. The dirty bin is right there when you walk out. Why are you leaving that towel in there for somebody else to come in there and clean up? I did it.
myself because I didn't want the firemen to have to look at my last ass teammates' towels and have to pick them up all the time. I saw the teammates that can vouch for that. And they can vouch for this story because it's true. Super Bowl year. We ain't winning it if y'all don't do little things. And did you sense a shift? Yes. No doubt. We can't, we, we, we started to come together even more so. I said, we're going to Super Bowl in New Orleans and we're winning it. <laughs> Get from New Orleans. His dream was to come back home and play here in the Super Bowl. Having respect for our trainers means putting our kitchen on time. Our towels are picked up off the floor and in the bin. In the locker room, cleaning up tape, not pissing on the seat. In the lounge, cleaning up up after our garbage and respecting their time because they're there for us. So it's all little things, but. It makes a huge difference. And this is junior level or minor hockey or whatever level. It, it, there's no age limit or level or anything for value. For example, respect. Earlier I was talking about resilience, but the video I showed is respect. But there's no age limit. And there's no uh, league that's too good to not show respect. And by doing the little things, those little things will pay off in the long run. We feel by holding people accountable the right way and talking about a simple thing is when you go into a practice um, at Walter Baker and your team goes in and when they leave to go for a practice, the locker room is just as clean as when they entered it. And it may be, maybe not a lot of people will notice it. The janitor might go, oh man, these guys are pretty good. They're pretty clean. They didn't have to do nothing. But in the long run, you're teaching them more than just cleaning them back to themselves. You're te teaching them more about respecting other people you're not you're not too good you're not better than the, the guy who has to come in and clean this up and so by instilling these small values in your team we feel um that was the first step with us when we got the 67s uh we were all together four years ago as a group together um the coaching staff new gm the only one that was still there was the equipment guy uh, hammy um he's been there for nine or ten years now but the first thing we had to do is we didn't want to shoot everywhere with our pillars, with our winning habits. We, we had to focus in on our, on our values and our DNA and what we want to be as a team. And it was not easy. And it being my first year, maybe I didn't see it as much as Bear and Mario because they realized they've been through it a lot. They've been coaching a long, long time. But some of the small things I thought wasn't that – I thought it was okay. But – those small details, if you let go, it slides and it slides and it slides. So, and then it snowballs out of control. And when I first started coaching, I thought, okay, it's a little thing, ah, you know, but those little things make differences. And by the end of it, we had a guy on our team, <clears throat> um, Noel Hoffenmeyer. The first year we had him, he was a little bit loud, a little bit, a lot of energy, but not controlled energy. And, <clears throat> excuse me, over time, by the time of it, our third year with him, we, every year we do uh, an introduction, the team introduction with the, the parents and uh, the billets and, and the coaching staff. We all get together, kind of like an opening uh, a season kind of thing together upstairs at TD Place. And after everyone was gone, Noel Hoffenmeyer, now was one of the older guys on the team, stayed behind, got garbage bags, and cleaned up all the tables with some of our older guys. And for us, coaches – it had way bigger impact than us even talking to our players about that. They took the initiative. They owned it. They cleaned up. So if I were to go to a young guy, Tommy, <laughs> Tom Johnson at the time, hey, TJ, why don't you go clean up? If I were to say maybe it would have had an impact, but by seeing his teammate, older teammate go and start cleaning the tables without anyone saying anything, I couldn't, us coaching staff couldn't say anything. But that goes to show how, the DNA and the values that we put in place and the players embraced it and enjoyed it and, and, and loved it and, and owned it. How by him just doing something small like that, for, for him, it was normal. He grew up with it. He learned it. And so now the message is getting passed on to our younger guys and our younger guys. And now hopefully we can keep that going the right way by having good uh, leadership and good players on your team. But it all started four years ago by doing the small things and noticing the small things. Um, 
when you go on the bench, for example, on the ice, making sure your sticks are put over on the boards nicely and not thrown everywhere. Small things. Those small things make a difference in the values you want to pick as your team and choose as your team. Um, next week, we're going to, I know I talked a little bit, a lot about a bunch of different topics, but I kind of, when I was putting this together and talking to a bunch of different coaches, I thought maybe I'd touch here and touch there a little bit, but they all kind of connect together. So I thought it flowed well into each other. Um, so in short, really um, enjoy embracing the process and enjoying the plan and, and having a plan. And by creating a plan and having pillars, something in your game, in your structure, your play, but having something other than your structure, which you can communicate and talk to your players, then you can narrow it down into your practices and then transforming that from your practices into your gameplay. And you have more of a relationship with your players versus just always talking about a two, one, two, four check or a, uh, a box in one D zone or man on man D zone. You have way more to talk about to the player and develop the player versus just structures. Because if, if, if Tom goes to play for another team next year, they might have a totally different structure anyways. But if you teach him all these pillars and all these ways to play better and make him a better player, he's going to be a better player no matter where he goes to play. So sp spending a lot of time in these areas, which whichever you feel as a coach is fits the way you want to play. If you want to play a fast game, you want to be in your face, Maybe you're teaching like good angles and good body positioning and good stick, good stick on puck. There's different things, but whatever you choose as a coach to be yours, you own it and have the players own it. Then you build, like I said, a good relationship with the players. And, and then by doing that, it spills over. But again, having a good foundation, having good values, and then it goes one step, one step at a time. But uh, one thing I've learned too, uh, working with Andre and Mario is, is you got to pick your battles. And you can't overload them right away. Um, so if you went into your team this year and you said, okay, we're going to have pillars, we're going to have values, we're going to have a DNA, and we're going to embrace the process. They're going to be like, what? What's going on? This is so much. Come on, coach. Like, it's a lot. So pick your battle. Find where you want to spend your energy and time on it. Hammer it down. And then once you feel you have a good grasp on this area, now maybe you can filter out into something else that, you feel it important to you guys and your your team and your organization. Um, yeah, so I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the, enjoyed the seminar. Thank you very much for uh, coming out tonight. And next week, we're going to go over uh, another one of our um, values. And we'll talk to other on, on our 201 game and closing quickly on our other pillars. So hope you guys enjoyed, guys. Have a great night. And if you have any questions, um, please uh, let me know. Uh, first things first, Norm, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Now we're, we're now we're cooking with, with gas. Um, we had a little bit of an issue while you were talking. Uh, I tried to interrupt you a couple of times, so it's all good. Um, that was great. Lots of great information, and and the videos were powerful because it was um, for me personally, just because it was uh, player driven and not coach driven. So that you talked about values. That's uh, one way to get it going is uh, player driven uh, for sure. Um, do we have any questions? I haven't seen any, a, a couple of thank yous and, and great job, but I haven't had any questions in. Do we have any questions uh, before we get you guys out of here tonight? Or do we want to save them till uh, next Thursday night when Norm is complete? I don't see any coming in. All right, well, speak now or forever hold your peace. All righty. So, Norm, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't have any questions coming in, so we'll get you out of there. And uh, we'll see you guys all uh, and girls next uh, Thursday night for part two of uh, Norm's presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.